Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Mailbag. That's right, it's Mailbag. We are back. It's Saturday. We are answering your questions. You send them to us at collidervideo at gmail.com. We pick them out. We answer them. Look who's here. Oh, hi. I'm so happy to be here with you. We haven't done a mailbag together in forever. It's, it's felt like a million years since we've done mailbag, since I've done mailbag with P. Nimmy. I feel like it actually has been something like two months because I feel like we were at the desk at some point together. That's right. We did fill in. Yeah. That's right. But it's always good because, you know, we kind of rock at the mailbag. We like answering the questions that you send us. And I say, what do you say? We just get right to it. Yeah, I think I'm all for that. All right. Okay, guys, we picked them out and some great questions this week. So as always, guys, go send them out to Collider Video. I look through them. Perry looks through them. We answer on Movie Talk and, of course, on our weekend show. So the first one comes from Michael Santiago, who writes, Hey, guys, love your show and watch it every day. With the increasing number of Marvel properties entering into the MCU, we're seeing a lot of variety in the genres, like Winter Soldier's supernatural adventures, like Doctor Strange. Marvel is making... Guardians of the Galaxy. So what would you think of an anthology type film based on the What If series exploring what would happen if certain MCU events happened differently? I'm kind of paraphrasing that. Thank you, Michael. He says, thanks for taking my question and have an awesome day. I love this question. I know anthologies. We've talked about horror anthologies Mm -hmm. on Nightmares Many, many times. Perry, what do you think? I think that's a format that not enough filmmakers and studios are utilizing right now. And especially when you're talking about the MCU, because think about how much fun people had with the one shots. Or think about the the Thor short that they released, where it showed what Thor was up to when he was not with everybody else in Civil War. Right. That kind of stuff plays really well. The only caveat, I think, here is this. What, what are these things called? The what if comics? Because right. I, di- I didn't know what they were. And I Googled them. And I started to read a a little bit about what each individual issue covers and oh those are interesting but oh those are major major no-nos in like uh an mcu where kevin feige and his team just have everything planned to a t exactly that's where i think that's why you wouldn't get at least a what if scenario because they've set it up that this this is a universe that needs years of planning so they're not going to just do a one-off and be like, well, what if Spider-Man didn't get bit by the spider? You know, they, they couldn't really do that at this point because these movies take a lot of money. They're going to, you're, you're going to need to set these things in motion years, like I said, in, in, in advance. However, what about like you're talking about a one shot, but make it into a feature length movie where you get in one movie, a Spider-Man adventure, a Doctor Strange adventure, a Thor adventure, a Hulk adventure. I would love that so much. I'd be really curious to see how they would do something like that because for most of the horror anthologies we've seen, one of the biggest problems is what what's called the wraparound segment, which is right. basically like you have short, 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 and what connects them in between is the wraparound. And it it's always been a little messy where that story isn't satisfying in and of itself. It's right. not satisfying in a way that explains why that story is connected to that. So I think that would probably be the big challenge but I would not mind seeing something like that at least be attempted I I would love it too and I got your wraparound it's Agent Coulson returning into the MCU and he's got to go he's got to go meet with every Avenger and helps them out in every way gives Clark Gregg something big to do I really miss Agent Coulson in the MCU. I miss movies. him too. I mean, and it it would give him something to do, and it would make sense for him his character to be doing something like that. So he did it in the one shots. Yeah. <sighs> well, there we go. You great. never know. <laughs> it was a great question. I don't think they'll ever do it just because of what goes into the planning of a Marvel movie. But it is such a great question. Something I'd like to see you too. I bet. There it is. I'll All right. Take it. Let's go on to next question. Dylan Davidson writes, "Hey, Collider crew." There's been a lot of speculation about a possible standalone Obi-Wan movie and what that would look like. I really believe that's a movie that could be the Logan of the Star Wars universe. Now, obviously, this won't be R-rated, but this could have the same tone and look that Logan had. Since this would be set on Tatooine, they can make this a sci-fi western set in the Star Wars universe. I also believe this would be the proper movie for McGregor to send off the character similar to Jackson, or sorry, Jackson, Jackman. Fans love McGregor, and I think the movie would be highly successful if it was a more adult, serious Obi-Wan solo film. Thank you for taking my question. I love this question so much. I I love it it so much. And I think it's it's actually a really good 
comparison to make, a lot of people kind of looked at Logan and said it's kind of like a Western, right? Yeah. It just had a very, it had a look to it, especially in those early scenes where he's like hiding out in whatever that cylinder was. It was like desert landscape and he's just, he looked old and battered like an old gunslinger, you know, coming into town. And when you think about Obi-Wan, that could work too. And I like the idea of a like a Western feel, a spaghetti Western, but his quick draw is his lightsaber. I like the sound of it too, but it kind of goes back to what we were just talking about with the MCU and just the fact that they have a very tight grip on the story and how they develop things and making sure everything is connected together and feels like it's part of the same universe. Right. Given what's going on with Han Solo, I don't want to bring up the negativity, mm-hmm. but oh, I have a feeling that now or even in the near future is not going to be the time where they fully embrace another genre. But if we're discussing like if we're going to discuss this in a way where it's like Rogue One equals war movie mm-hmm. in, in that respect, you know, where where it was a war movie, but it was also very clearly a Star Wars movie that yes. tied into everything else exceptionally well. I see where you're Maybe going. something like this is possible, but not to the extent that I think Logan deviated from the other Wolverine movies and the X-Men movies. And it just occurred to me, as much as I do like the idea and I'm totally on board, if they end up doing the Boba Fett movie as rumored, I think Boba Fett lends himself better to a Western mm-hmm. because then you can get like the Desperados that are the bounty hunters hunters and you can have almost like tombstone with the cowboys that wear the red uh, sash it's like the bounty hunters and they're all like doing something that could work but i do like this question picture it's fun to picture hey maybe put the bounty hunters in an obi-wan movie can we do that actually can we make boba fett can we do that was scrapped because trank was let go what if we just put boba fett into the obi-wan movie everybody wins Everybody, well, everybody wins, but everybody wins with one movie, whereas we could have two movies and we could win double. You're right. Two movies is better. Great question, Dylan. Thank you. Let's move on. Jonathan Spiroff writes, hey, Collider crew, my question is how do we think Spider-Man villains are going to be divided up between the MCU and Sony's Marvel Universe? Who gets to go where? The only certain I could assume is a Green Goblin appearance in a Spider-Man 3. My God, this Hmm. is the best question. It's great and it's complicated yeah. and luckily for you guys we ran a little explainer video trying to break down what this Sony Marvel deal really is but yeah. that was particularly for Tom Holland and how he can cross over and right. where Venom comes into play. When we're talking about villains across the board though I was talking a little bit about this with Adam Chitwood because we worked on that Sony Marvel video together right. and he was explaining it to me as Sony is in a position right now where they feel very fortunate to have Marvel as a creative partner. Mm -hmm. So if Marvel said to them, we want villains XYZ in the next Spider-Man Homecoming movie or in the MCU, I think Sony would play ball. Yeah. But I think technically Sony's the one with the rights to all these characters. So it's it's kind of Sony's little pile to hoard. And then creatively, they just have to work it out with Marvel. Right. And so based on a THR article that came out, much like what we were doing with our with our explainer video, they kind of broke down a lot of like how the rights worked out, and then they just did this off mention that they say Craven the Hunter, mm-hmm. Mysterio, and Carnage. So Carnage is appearing in Venom movie as the villain. I don't know how you do this, and that Craven and Mysterio are getting their own spinoffs. So I guess if we can go by that logic, and THR is a very reliable source. We have to cross those villains off the list yeah. that they will not be appearing in the MCU. It's very much a partnership, and they just kind of have to decide between themselves who gets what and then stick to the agreement. There is no like piece of paper that says Marvel gets these and Sony gets these. It's something that they're going to have to work out as these films develop. Yeah, and it's, it is very complicated. But just by that logic and me geeking out, and because Spidey is back at home— with Marvel, when you go Green Goblin or Doc Ock is the like the heir apparent to the villain like to introduce in that Spider-Man universe? You you would think so. And are you talking about the Marvel Cinematic Universe Marvel now Cinematic or the universe. Marvel Universe? No, nope. Marvel. Two yeah, I know. Things. Oh my God! I have Did, a feeling, do we lose anybody? <laughs> I have, well, the, if you watch the video, you're not lost. Yeah, um, there you go. If we're talking about the MCU, I don't think that 
and this is just my own speculation, I don't think that Marvel would want to reuse something that was done so well in mm. successful Spider-Man movies, whether it okay. was their movie or not. Gotcha. So I would imagine that they would want to pick some new folks out there because I think that works in their favor pretty damn well in Homecoming. And if, if it works really well there, why, why backtrack and go the safe route or the route that people already know those villains? See, now with that... That makes a good point, and it kind of bums me out because I would, I think the best, one of the best villains is Craven the Hunter. I would have loved to see him be the villain in a MCU movie because Craven, the greatest game he always said was man, but then the greatest game for him <laughs> was Spider Man. Mm -hmm. And for him to hunt Spider Man just by looking out and going, look at that guy, I want to take him out. There's just a, and then introduce him in the Marvel universe. What does that mean for the Avengers? That's very interesting to me, but it, it really breaks down to I think. Would you say Sony has the rights to do whatever they want with their villains? That's why we're getting the movies. And so, even if Marvel said we want this one, they go sorry, we're developing a movie with that one. I believe Sony has the rights to all the Spider-Man comic villains, but they are in a creative agreement with Marvel that they value. So if Marvel said, we would like these characters, as long as they're not already in development mm -hmm. or even pre-pro on a movie featuring that villain, I think they'd be able to work it out. Hmm. Good point. All right. Well, we'll it's going to shake out. Spider-Man's coming out. It's going to do big, big money, I'm sure. We yeah, love it. Might it. Make a couple bucks. it might make a couple bucks. It should bucks. make all the monies. It should make all the monies. And then we're going to see what happens when Ven Venom comes out. My God, October of 2018, next <sighs> year. So we'll see. All right. We move on to Carlos M. He writes, greetings, Collider crew. Because of the hype generated by all of you at Collider who've already watched Baby Driver, I must confess I can't wait to watch it myself. However, I still wonder, despite all the great reviews, what are its chances of succeeding at the box office with so much competition? Wonder Woman, Cars 3, Transformers, Despicable Me 3. And then, let's keep in mind, Spider-Man Homecoming is already opening in theaters next week. Wouldn't August have been a better and safer release date? I would love to know your take on this. Keep all the amazing work, guys. Yeah, go, Perry. I know you have yeah, thoughts on I this. I do have thoughts on this. Um, okay, so first... If you watch my review, Baby Driver is fantastic, similar to Spider-Man Homecoming. It deserves all the monies. Yeah. Then again, it is a much more under-the-radar movie, clearly, compared to these massive summer blockbusters that are going to gobble up, you know, the large majority of the box office pie there, and it's only going to leave a small sliver, but... When you compare it to other Edgar Wright films, this one has a very good shot at opening the biggest of them all and beating Hot Fuzz. I think that... I put it at about 14 million in my predictions, which I think is a solid start. But this is also a situation where the buzz is so overwhelmingly positive that I think that word of mouth is, I mean, is really going to push this thing forward. And it could give it really, really long legs to the point that it could wind up being his most profitable movie by far. Yeah, I think the word of mouth is off the hook with this. You have your Edgar Wright fans that are going to go seek out this movie. Then you have... I, I would say I'm I'm both an Edgar Wright fan as well as a geeky fan, so I would probably see Spider Man and Baby Driver in one weekend. But then you bring up the great point: the word of mouth that's going to travel to somebody like my mother, who I always bring up as an example. She'll go, "Oh, I heard about this because somebody was on Good Morning America talking about it, or she read some Facebook post, which she's tend to do, so she will go see that movie as well." I like the idea of it having legs, and just because of the reviews, mm -hmm. it goes wide, and everybody wants to see this. However, let's answer the second part of the question. Yeah, Would the have August done thing. better in August? There's no, there's no clear-cut rule with this kind of stuff. It's, you know, the, the simple answer isn't just because you move away from the big summer blockbusters doesn't mean you're more likely to get more money because mm. August is also a bit of a dead zone. Then again, August has also been a place, and same with September, January, certain months that we consider low box office number months where there is so little competition. If something sparks, it could really catch and make an insane amount of money, but sure. that that's a risky game to play, and I don't 
don't know if it would have been a good thing for Baby Driver of all movies to move into that zone because we have, uh, what, what's the Hitman movie coming out then? Oh, uh, the Hitman's Bodyguard? Yes, we have that movie and we also have uh, Logan Lucky. And I mm. think that there could be a little too much crossover with this where it would have been like, oh, which one do I see? Whereas right now, I mean, really overall, I've never seen anything quite like Baby Driver. But right now in particular, it's like, you know, you have Baby Driver, then you have a really great superhero movie. You have an animated movie you could go see with your whole family. So it seems like there would have been too much direct competition around that time of the year, this year in particular. Perry makes great points because you have a lot of options in this release window. Maybe that's what they're going with. And, you know, who knows? I'm banking on the word of mouth to be so positive that people need to go see it. And I implore everyone to do just that. I haven't seen it yet, but based on all the reviews and my love, my absolute undying love for Edgar Wright, I know I'm going to love this movie. Listen to this guy. There it is. I think your instincts are right. Instincts right about you, right? Yeah. The, that, that, that too. Okay, that too. Good. Just okay. in case there was any confusion. No confusion here. <laughs> all right. Let's move on to our very last question of the day. Heston Roberts writes, Hey Collider, with all the great reviews of Spider-Man, is it safe to say that the release of the recent amazing comic book films will finally end rumors of comic book fatigue. First Logan, then Guardians of the Galaxy, then Wonder Woman, and now Spider-Man. It's a great year for Marvel and DC financially and with critical responses. With Justice League and Thor still on the way, do you think 2017 is the best year of comic book films? Thanks for choosing my question. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think this is a great question. And, and reading through this now, my God, one of the best superhero years on record yeah i didn't even stop to think about it because we've seen spider-man we both loved it wonder woman i adored you liked it right oh i oh, liked it <laughs> <laughs> um guardians of the galaxy i still like the original but i had a hell of a time i loved volume two a lot and then logan my god is one of my favorite of the year can't wait for thor mm -hmm. more so than justice league sorry i know i have a superman tattoo but man thor ragnarok with taika watiti that just looks off the hook and, of course, Justice League, I can't wait. But what do you think? Is there comic book fatigue? Ah, well, I think that this is the perfect time for that question to come up. Because, yep. no, look at some of the highest grossing movies of the year. And look at the quality of those movies. Really, one of... So, I walked out of Spider-Man Homecoming last night freaking thrilled about how good that individual movie is. But then when you start to think about it a little more, it's also really exciting because it is two studios coming together and make yeah. something really great together, which is unprecedented and a really big deal. And then you also have to step back and think, okay, that makes how many incredible comic book adaptations this year? It is so clear to me this year in particular. And I don't want to go as far to say that 2017 is going to be the best year ever because while I do have high High hopes for both Thor and for Justice League as well y you never know so I'm not yeah. gonna say that just yet but at this point in the year coolest thing about the comic book adaptations we're getting is that they give you exactly what you want if you're looking for that type of movie yeah. yet I think every single one I, I mean, no I, I don't think I know every single one that you just listed feels unique and different and special in its own way. So that is really cool that we can continue this genre, but keep it fresh at the same time. I totally agree with you. And then for my point on comic book fatigue, I don't know. Are you fatigued on comedies, which is a genre? Are you fatigued on Westerns, which is a genre? Drama, thriller, horror? Comic book movies is a genre now, and it is here to stay. I don't care what people think. I'm serious. Comic book superhero movies are a genre that they're not going to go away. You're going to have good ones. You're going to have bad ones. They're going to continue to be here for the foreseeable future. I know what I think the question really is asking, are there too many comic book movies? And they take away mm -mm. from some of your enjoyment, but that's that's on the audience. Look at look at the box office. Wonder Woman opens to 103 point whatever million opening weekend. People are going to see this. So with Wonder Woman, the grandmother right? The of, grandmother. Sure. The grandmother of all the superhero movies. We have so much to look forward to. We have Black Panther next year. They're going to keep reinventing the superhero genre. So I feel like we're going to get new and fresh titles coming out. So there might not be a feeling of fatigue. It'll be a feeling of just 
awesome because we have all these new titles coming. Oh, no, absolutely. And when it comes to the MCU, I think they're doing such an exceptional job planting the seeds to bring characters together, Mm -hmm. to separate them and do all sorts of things right now with, you know, whatever is going to come after phase three, that there's so much potential there. When it comes to the DCEU, I'm not entirely sure what they have planned for Justice League in that same respect. So it's hard to compare. But, you know, given what we saw in Wonder Woman, if they can continue to respect their characters and understand their characters to that extent, I mean, I think we're in for some pretty good stuff from both sides here. That's that's the best point. Yeah. As, as long as they keep doing something, telling a good story. Yeah. We're in for something great. So. All right. Hey. That'll do it for Mailbag on Saturday. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, please, as always, send in your questions at, at collidervideo at gmail.com. We pick them out. We answer them like this. So, Perry, where could the good people find you? I am on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. Also, don't forget, later today, Collider Beer Pong is back and me and Makuga are crushing it. My God, you guys. I don't, I don't know what I, happens. I just the... really like playing beer pong. Win or lose, I enjoy it. I, I, I know you do. Any any reason to have beer pong in the office, I'm okay with Cal had fun, too. Cal had fun. He did. And you can find me at Riley around on Twitter and Instagram, guys. And we will see you, I don't know, maybe we'll be around tomorrow's mailbag? Hmm. See you then.